Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering what we could expect for the length of this thing. Going to be similar in length um, to the to the midterm exams. Um, it's going to take you a little bit longer because it's going to be more problem solving questions. Um, so it'll probably be less writing but a lot more thinking on this exam. Um, so that's what you'll be able to expect. Is um, length of time will take you a little bit longer than the midterms, but the actual uh, number of questions and amount of writing you have to do very similar to the midterm exams. Um, okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to, yeah. Are you going to heavily test some discussion questions for week 10? Because those were only posted last night and we don't have much time to do them. Um, week 10 discussion problems will be on there. Um, but it's going to be about the same as the distribution discussion problems we've seen on the, the midterms. Um, the discussion problems are going to be actually on the exam will only be from week 7 to 10. And they'll be worth um, 33 of the 100 points on the final. And then there'll be one problem solving sort of story question that's based on week seven for 10 uh, through 10, just like we've seen in the midterms. And then some additional problem solving questions that can uh, uh, be from any part of what we've covered throughout the entire quarter. Yeah. So that's gonna be the, the uh, format of this final exam. More problem solving questions uh, than you're used to. But I think you guys will be able to do it. Okay, so today what we're doing is we're just going to recap a lot of what we talked about today, uh, through the entire quarter, and put it into perspective, and basically answer the question of why do we ever study biochemistry, other than the fact that it's a general requirement for everyone's major um, that's taking this course. Um, so why do, we, why do we study biochemistry in general? And really, the easy answer is, why do we learn anything new? Why do we study anything at all? Um, and the reason we do this, the reason we learn things, is because you guys are here because you know that knowledge is fulfillment. That learning new things is fun, right? It's, it's hard uh, going back to when you were a child and learning about the world and how much fun that was. But also, learning about the world allows you to live a more fulfilling life. Think about when you learned about physics. Something as simple as gravity, inertia, friction, things like that. Learning about that as a kid fundamentally changed the way you interact with the world around you, and so too does learning about biochemistry and the principles of biochemistry. All right, so really what biochemistry is, is it's the intersection of biology with the other fields of sciences, right? And we talked about this. We talked about how obviously we intersect with chemistry. <coughs> When we learned about things like catalysis and the breaking and forming of uh, chemical bonds. All right, a lot of that stuff was similar to what you guys should have learned in organic chemistry. All right, we also talked about physics in here. We had, uh, uh, we learned about things like the um, physical properties of biomaterials and how that influences their behavior. <coughs> I was talking about things like hydrophobicity, uh, electronegative potential, things like that. There's also thermodynamics, which you guys probably covered in 108A and B. The directionality and the rates of reactions. took a brief foray into quantum mechanics. And all of this is just to illustrate the point that the forces that guide biological systems are the same forces that guide the behavior of all matter and waves in the entire universe. These same principles are what's uh, determining the behavior of biological systems. Right? And so, if we think about the biochemist lens or how knowledge of biochemistry changes the way we look at the world or influences the way the, uh, we look at the world, and we want to consider the things that a biochemist is really concerned with. But what a biochemist is really concerned with is, as far as biological systems, we really want to know about energy. That's 
one big thing we always want to know about. Where does the energy come from? What form is it taking <coughs> on? Where is the energy going? Because all that we do requires a heck of a lot of energy. All right, and we saw many different forms that energy took throughout this quarter. We started off with a photon, right? Which is not biological, it comes from the sun, right? This is a wave of light. And we saw that biological systems interact with photons and they turn them into a different form of energy, an exciton, an electron hole pair, where that energy of the photon is keeping the electron from its positively charged hole. Right? And we saw that chromophores do this conversion. You can think of this as a reaction. Chromophores catalyze the conversion of photon energy into exciton energy. All right? And they're also able to transport this exciton energy. We talked about exciton <laughs> transfer. We can move this energy around in space to other locations. Right? And then we talked about another form of energy, electronegative potential. Voltage. Does an electron want to move someplace or not? Right? This, is, this is what guided us through electron transport chains. Biological systems are behaving a lot like wires. DC current. Electrons are moving uh, to more positively charged areas, just like um, when you apply a voltage to a wire. And we saw that this conversion happened in the reaction center with a special pair of chlorophyll. It catalyzed that conversion of exciton energy to uh, a high electronegative potential to allow electron transport to occur. And then we saw that this electronegative potential, if we can use this to get like electrons on demand when we synthesize an ADP, an ADPH, we have now electrons that we can use if we need to reduce something. And we can also convert it to another form of energy, an electrochemical gradient. <coughs> and this was catalyzed by the cytochrome complex. We can use a change in electronegative potential to make a proton gradient. And we know that there's energy in that electrochemical gradient. And so the electrochemical gradients in um, living systems are almost like batteries. They're uh, this source of energy across the membrane that we can use for transporting things. We learn about membrane transport. It relies on the <coughs> electrochemical gradient, the energy in it. But this electrochemical gradient is also used to form sort of the chemical energy currency. Through the F1, F0, ATPase, which I think you guys covered in 108B, we can, we can take that electrochemical gradient, turn that energy into chemical bonds, high energy phosphate bonds. What we mean by high energy chemical bonds is that when we break those bonds, we get a release of free energy. Right? We, we know that ATP was used to charge a lot of carbons. <laughs> and we went through biosynthetic pathways to allow uh, biosynthetic pathways, give them the energy to move forward. Right? So this was ATP, which was used mostly to make good leading groups, to make the chemistry move forward. And we also learned that this electrochemical gradient, we gave one example of how this was turned into mechanical energy. <coughs> and that would be a change in conformation, something changing its shape or actually physically moving <coughs> in space. And those of you that go on to study things like um, uh, dynein and um, transport along actin filaments and stuff, we'll, we'll learn that ATP can also be used to create mechanical <coughs> energy, changes in shape and physical motions in proteins. All right, so we see energy taking all these different forms in biological systems. 
That's something we're really concerned with as biochemists. Because energy is how all this gets done. So if you think about, if you distill this down to its most simplest form, if you consider the difference between something like a rock, a non-living system, and some living system, the difference is, is how the energy is handled. If light shines on this rock, it's going to be dissipated as heat, radiated as heat. The, the rock is going to warm up. And you know how much heat that is. If this is uh, a photon with something like 200 kilojoules per Einstein of energy, we're going to create 200 kilojoules per mole of heat energy, just given up, just warming up that rock. What living systems do is we have all these components that are acting as middlemen. So instead of immediately radiating, radiating off heat, instead of what we do is we convert this energy into different forms. And every once in a while we get a small release, something like um, 30 kilojoules per mole of energy. We talked about that was a really common sort of driving force for chemical reactions. Every once in a while, we give off a little bit of heat. So when we get this release of free energy, we warm things up. But we don't do it very often. <coughs> right? So what we've done is we've just broken down this release of heat to multiple small steps. And therein lies all the biochemistry we talked about, and an immersion property of which is everything we do. It enables us to come to and from class, determines what we're going to desire and what we're going to become. Just because we're middlemen in this dissipation of light energy as heat. And that's all the biology right there. Taking this energy, putting it to good use. Don't just warm up the world, break it up into smaller steps. We can do amazing things and build complex systems with it. Right, so as biochemists, we're concerned with energy. We're also concerned with the physical properties of biomolecules. Right, because the physical properties of these biomolecules determine how they behave when placed in an environment, how they interact with each other. Their function. One of the most interesting things we talked about as far as physical properties was biological membranes. They're not just hydrophobic, they have other complex physical properties like low dielectric constant, things like that. Give them uh, not only a way to separate from water, but also keep things from passing through them. Not everything, mostly ions, really soluble things don't want to pass through these membranes. So the physical properties of any biomolecule are going to determine its function. Right? And you see that what these living systems did is they used energy to construct biomolecules with specific physical properties, functional groups in specific places. Those membranes self-assembled. That's because they were built to do that. It didn't happen by chance. Another thing we were concerned with were interactions. We talk about this a lot um, as it related to regulation. But we also talked about it just in the, in the stochastics of how a reaction takes place. We talked about that, for example, in transcription. <coughs> transcription initiation. <coughs> right, so interactions. How do proteins, biomolecules, interact with each other? And how do those interactions change over time? With regulation, uh, glutamine synthetase is a great... Uh, great example of how different protein interactions completely changes the activity of dental transferase, of NR1. And those interactions change depending on one small modification of P2. We irritate it or we don't. Completely different interactions, completely different consequences thereof. The transcription initiation, we talked about how RNA polymerase just always interacts with DNA. And that allows it to find promoters very efficiently because it's scanning in one dimension instead of scanning, looking in three dimensions for the uh, promoter site. All right, so how these, how these biomolecules interact with other biomolecules, RNA polymerase with DNA, is very important for its function. 
And we wouldn't be able to do transcription initiation without those kinds of interactions. They're very important for the function of proteins and other biomolecules. All right, so these are what we're concerned with as biochemists. And really, this whole course was just examples of these different things to get these, these uh, principles into your head. But we can have energy in multiple different forms and convert between them. That the physical properties of biologic molecules matter and determine their function. And that interactions between different biomolecules can be dynamic and can add great complexity to regulation and even enable chemistry that couldn't happen before as the transcription initiation. Okay, so in the remaining time, what I want to do is I want to introduce you guys to the research I do, what I work on in the lab, and how the biochemist lens influences the experiments I do, and the way that I question the biological system I'm working in. All right? So I'm a researcher, so I'm all about questions. Some of you might not be into research. Some of you may be taking the power of the biochemist lens and using it instead to control the world around us, create things like new drugs, alter the way our bodies work to get a, a predicted outcome, <coughs> things like that. Or even make new materials with new properties that are relevant in some way to our lives, make, make our lives easier in some way. For me, I just ask questions. Right? And the questions I, work, uh, I ask are about a system called contact-dependent growth and addition systems. CDI systems, contact dependent growth inhibition systems. And the initial observation was kind of cool. There was a woman um, working with rat colonies, and all she was doing was she wanted to know what kinds of different E. coli species were present in these rats. And usually, if you pull out a rat, you find that it has about a dozen or so different strains of E. coli in it, right? hundreds and thousands of different species of bacteria, but if you look just at E. coli, one species, you see there's about a dozen different strains. But in one colony, she noticed that there was just one strain, EC93, and it was the only E. coli in town, in these guts of these rats. She wanted to know why that was. All right, so um, uh, she sent this off to David Lowe, you guys are all familiar with, geneticist here at UCSB. And what David Lowe found is if he takes EC93 and he mixes it with some other bacteria, uh, another E. coli, just a lab strain, what happens over time is this guy dies. It's dead. And this guy grows just fine. So we get a ton of EC93s growing. And the E. coli's we put in at the start, they die. <coughs> he wanted to figure out how this happened, and he found that the cells actually have to touch for this to happen. So he found that it happens in two steps. All right, so we'll have our CDI plus cell here, a cell that can kill others. He found that the first step was adhesion. We call this a target neighboring cell. First they touch and they adhere to each other. And then after that, the target cell dies. Either stops growing or just completely loses viability altogether. It dies completely. So first they, they touch, they adhere, and then the target cell dies. And since David's a geneticist, he wants to know what are the genes involved. Right? And what he found is EC93, there's just three genes that are responsible for this. Three genes. The three genes are all hooked up in one <coughs> locus. They are CDIB, CDIA, and a little CDII. You can take these three genes, you can stick them in any E. coli, and it'll kill everyone else. That's how he isolated the genes. He made a library, and this guy was the survivor after growing them up together. <coughs> He killed everyone else. So it's really easy to pull these genes out. 
right? And then he, he interrogated the target cells. He looked for resistant mutants, guys that were not killed by the system. And what you can find is if this is the, uh, a target cell has an inner membrane and outer membrane, because these are gram negatives, he got a mutation in an outer membrane protein called BAMA. And then one screen, a, resistant, uh, a resistance mutant in the inner membrane protein, YCIP. All right, so this is what genetics got us. Genetics got us genes that can kill and genes that when you mutate, you're resistant. So these genes are probably required if you, to be killed. All right? So now we have our biochemist lens on. And now we're asking questions as biochemists. We're concerned about things like energy, physical properties, and interactions. All right, so what questions might we ask through our biochemist lens about how this system works? Well, if we think about interactions, we can see an interaction here. The cells are actually touching. The cells are physically interacting. Right? What's the nature of that interaction? What's, what's holding them together? So this is where my work began. So this is the most obvious candidate for something to hold two cells together. This guy's on the outside of the cell, the MA. All right, so that's the target cell is probably uh, going to have, we're going to have some interaction with the MA here. All right, and then this system is actually really, these through bioinformatics, we know that the CDIB and CDIA are very similar to a two-partner secretion system where CDIB sits in the outer membrane and CDIA it sticks out from the cell like this. Right? Sticks out from the cell like that. And so you can do things. We wonder, does CDIA actually interact with BAMA? Are there interactions there? What's the nature of that interaction? And so what we did is uh, we took CDIA, we chopped it up in pieces. <laughs> And then we took BAMA in vitro, just in a test tube, and we looked to see if they interact, see if they touch each other. Really easy assay. You can take a little fragment of CDIA, and just fuse it to something like a HIS-6 tag that allows it to bind uh, beads with nickel on them. All right, so we, we let it bind these beads, we mix it with BAMA, and we see this, do these beads pull down BAMA when they have a specific fragment attached to them? So we're looking for, for an interaction between the receptor and the outer membrane protein and the CDIA. All right, so we'll call these different regions, let's call them one, two, three, four, and five. Just to be, uh, just to keep it easy on ourselves. So we pull down region one, region two, region three, region four, and region five, and we look, we do a western block for BAM A. See if we see it, what we see is that region three we see that our band was pulled down, not in any of the other regions. All right, so now what we have is we have what we call a receptor binding region. And we can make a prediction about the behavior of this system. What's probably happening <coughs> is <coughs> CDIA is sticking out from the surface. This region right here interacts with BAMA on the surface of a neighboring cell, and then we get death. <coughs> we tested that, we deleted this region three, did an imprint deletion. The cells, uh, these cells don't kill anymore. They also don't even adhere to the target cells. So it looks like we're on the right track, All right? And then we wanted to know BAMA's contribution to this. How's, what's going on here? So this, you can imagine, is pretty easy, too. BAMA is an outer <coughs> membrane beta barrel, just like we talked about here in class. So there's going to be parts of the protein that are on the outside, and parts of the protein that are on the inside, and parts of the protein that are stuck in the membrane. So through our biochemist lens, we say, there's an interaction here. It's probably going to be with some parts that are exposed, that are on the extra side of the face. And so we go in and we started mutating these and see if we still get this interaction. All right? And what we found was there were two loops. 
So there's a total of seven loops here, and I'll have them all drawn. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We found that this loop right here, and this loop right here, loops six and seven. So if we delete loop six, or if we delete loop seven, the protein still gets assembled in the outer membrane, but we no longer get adhesion, and the cells are completely resistant. Right? The cells are completely resistant. This result actually explained another, uh, another aspect of CDI. So I told you way back when, when this, when this woman was, was looking at these strains, that only E. coli cells were being wiped out in the guts. All the other cells were fine. Right? It was only E. coli cells. And then when we took this in the lab, we found that this target cell has to be an E. coli. If it's not an E. coli, it's any other species. It doesn't get hit. And we wondered why that was. Well, it turns out that this extracellular sequence here, this BAM8 protein is present in all bacteria, but E. coli have a specific sequence here that's not found in any other species. And this led us on to something, something this, this biochemist lens let us in on a little hint of what this thing is doing. It's recognizing specifically E. coli. It wants to kill just E. coli. It doesn't want to kill anyone else. You still don't know why that is. That's kind of interesting, right? If you want to kill someone, wouldn't you want to just kill everyone and be the only guy in town? So EC93 himself is an E. coli, and he's only killing other E. coli. Pretty interesting. You still don't know why that is. There's interactions there, right? Other people in lab, they were interested in, well, how are the cells dying? What's killing the cells? So they started off with bioinformatics, which is a powerful tool. And what they found is if you compare CDIA, you just do a blast search, which compares the CDIA protein to other proteins. All other proteins look for similarities. What you find is that this terminal domain here looks like toxins, specifically nucleases. Things that cut DNA and RNA. So you're like, oh, well, maybe this is a nuclease. There's a nuclease on the tip of this protein, right? And so what they did was they cloned this protein, and they expressed it, and cells died. And then they look at what's going on with the DNA and RNA, and they find that there's a specific tRNA, ALA1B, that's being cut right there. And it just so happens if you cut right there, the tRNA never gets amino isolated, gets taken out of the tRNA pool, and the cells can't translate anymore because they can't add alanines uh, during translation. They essentially make this tRNA non-functional. Alright? Okay, so the cells die. There's two problems with this. First, why does an EC33 die? an EC93 die. You take this gene, you express it, the cells die. If you express it along with the downstream, so we'll call this CT, because this is C-terminal line of CDIA, if you express this along with CDII, there's no death. Aha! Now we know what's going on here. The CDII gene somehow prevents LO1B from getting cut. How could it do that? How might it prevent the ala one BTRA from getting cut? Binds? What could it bind? Ah, I've got a couple different answers here. It could bind the tRNA, right? Protect it. Maybe it binds this protein. It prevents it from uh, having any activity, any nucleus activity. What assay could we do to, to figure that out? <coughs> Similar assay to what we did over here. <coughs> we put a little his tag on this guy. We can pull him, we can express these, we can pull out CDI, see what's bound to it. And it turns out that these guys, the CT and the immunity protein, bind very, very tightly. Nanomolar affinity, sometimes femtomolar. On the order of the biotin streptavidin. 
interaction. Two, order mag two orders of magnitude stronger than antibody antigen interactions. <coughs> Pretty much the strongest non covalent binding you can get are these kinds of interactions. They bind really tightly. So that's what's happening. This complex isn't able to cut. Uh, we have crystal structures in these complexes, and usually what happens is the immunity protein actually covers the active site, the nuclease active site of this CT, so that the tRNA no longer has access to the active site, can't get cut. So that's how the cells are dying, and that's how EC93 lives. <coughs> really, really cool. There's another problem with this. Anybody see another problem with this? So if this is our target cell, right, we have our receptor out here, we have receptor binding region, and then here's our toxin at the end. Where are tRNAs in this cell? tRNAs are in here. So here's our alpha one b tRNA. But our CT is out here. So what has to happen? We're going to kill it. This has got to go, this has got to go in there. It's very similar to a process we've talked about, membrane transport. So this is big, and there's charge groups on it, which means if we're going to pull it through a membrane, what do we need? <coughs> Does this happen spontaneously? We need some kind of an energy source. We need some sort of, sort of a catalyst to get this through. All right? It's not going to happen all by itself. Well, we have some hints. We know that there's another protein. There's our outer membrane receptor MA and our inner membrane receptor YCIB. So you, you mutate either of these guys, and L one B does not get cut. All right, so they're they're the catalyst here. Probably the catalyst for getting this CT from outside to inside. But what I was concerned with, and actually this is an experiment I came up with um, after TA biochemistry last year, after talking about membrane transport. What I was concerned with is what's the source of energy. So this is a big protein about 20 to 30 kilodaltons. And even if you have a pore, you need something like a huge nuclear pore complex to pull this in without using energy. And even so, if you want it to go in and not just come in right back out, you need energy. You need a release of free energy because that's what gives reactions a direction. All right, so with our biochemist's lens, we know that there must be energy. If this goes in and stays in, has to stay in to cut a lot of t it has to cut a lot of tRNAs to kill the cell. <coughs> there must be some energy. We must have some negative delta G. We want to know what that was. So what could possibly be the negative delta G? And we, we need it for two different membranes. We need the negative delta G here and the negative delta G here. Well, the negative delta G here should be easy. We know that there's a gradient here. There's a proton gradient across the inner membrane. All right? But there isn't one out here. And so um, thinking about like BTUB and TOMB and stuff, um, what I did was I took this system and I added um, what are called uncoupling factors or uncoupling agents. These are things that dissipate the proton motor force. Right, so there's no more proton motor force. These are things <coughs> like cyanide and uh, dinitrophenol. Ways of preventing this proton motor force, um, they basically allow the protons to pass across the membrane. Dissipates it completely. And what I find is if I have untreated cells, I see that um, my ALA1B tRNA is cut. But if I treat with, uh, for example, cyanide, I see that the ALA1B is full length. So this would be our um, full length ALA1B. Right? So normal cells would have this length. If you uh, inhibit them with the toxin, they get cut. <coughs> All right? So I treat with CCC2, <coughs> and no longer do I see cutting. But that could be for any number of reasons. So one thing I did was I expressed the CT inside the cell in the presence of CCCP, and it got cut. So that tells me that it's going from outside to inside. That's the process that's being interrupted by the PMF. Okay? 
So we have active transport through the membranes. We know how that's done in E. coli, right? We studied that in this very course. What are the, what are the protein components that link the PMF to the outer membrane and allow transport of things through? Ton B. There's Ton B, and then there's another one we didn't talk about, Tol A, another system that does a similar thing, transports other micronutrients. All right, so my idea of what was going on here is here's our outer membrane, here's our inner membrane. Maybe Ton B is what's taking the PMF along with EXBB and EXBD. And we're getting something similar to the colocins. Well, we're parasitizing some other import pathway. All right? So this is easy. All I have to do is knock out tone B. And I should get resistance, just like for colocins. That's how they got resistance. These guys are completely sensitive. Same with tole. These knockouts have no effect. That's where I'm at right now. <laughs> That's where I've been for the last uh, month and a half. De delta Tom B, Delta Tol A, they have no effect. Um, so what do you think is going on here? <laughs> uh, getting through the membranes. <laughs> so let's talk about how these guys were isolated, these mutants. So these guys, there's two classes of colocins. One class, if you knock out ton B, the colicin doesn't get in, the, the toxin. Uh, Tol A is, an, is a, uh, used for a separate class of colicin. <coughs> the colicins, remember, were how these were identified in the first place. We did not know these were active transport systems until we got resistance mutants to toxins going through the two membranes. It just so happens that if you knock these out, not only is there no effect on colicins, or, or, sorry, no effect on my guy, but uh, if you knock these out, you get resistance to these colicins, but also the cells still grow. The cells are fine with these knockouts. They do not die. Right? So these are not lethal mutations. So maybe what's going on here is there's a similar system that's essential. That we can't knock out, that we can't do genetics with. That's what I think anyway. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> There's two ways we're look, trying to look at this. We're trying to find interactions uh, chemically with some component. Not having much luck there. Technically very difficult. Because these interactions only last for half a second, just during the transport step. So I might not get stable interactions. Um, we're also trying to do genesis. I don't know. If it's essential, it's really hard to find. So we'll see where that goes. All right? We'll see where that goes. So. With this biochemist lens, we learn more about these systems, but then we also come up with more questions. Why is EC93 only killing E. coli? Why isn't it killing everything? What's that all about? How the hell is this getting through the membranes? It requires energy. I know what the energy source is, even. It's, it's the PMF. I don't know how it's getting through, though. I still don't know how it's getting through. And this is because the colison guys had it easy. They just got some knockouts that were resistant. Um, it might be YCIB. He might be doing it. Um, the thing about E. coli is if there's a Y in the name of the gene, it means we don't know what it does. <laughs> so I know what BAN-A does. Um, it assembles out of membrane proteins into the out of membrane. YCIB, they have no idea what it does. Um, <coughs> So to interrogate that, I have to figure out what its, what its role is. You knock out YCIB, and nothing happens to the cells. So it's hard to tell what YCIB is doing. But it's definitely involved in some way. We're still trying to figure that out. So the weird thing is YCIB doesn't attach to any adapters that would, that would span the paraplasm. So it might just be a red herring. It might be doing something else. I'm not sure. Anyway, so that's what I work on. Um, and this is how the biochemist lens has influenced my experiments in the lab and also helped us learn some new things, but also open up some brand new questions, some new areas of insight. All right? um, and really, the, the progress of this project comes from taking this problem and looking at it through different lenses, through a geneticist lens, finding out what the genes are that are involved in addition to the biochemist lens. And now, 
with this idea that it's only hitting E. coli, now we've got to look at it through an evolutionary lens. How did this evolve and why did it evolve to do this? Right? By, looking, by having these different biological tools, these different lenses to look through, there's a wealth of questions and a wealth of knowledge hiding, even in a simple system like this. It's happening in our gut right now, unbeknownst to us for millennia until 2005. Okay, so um, lastly, I just want to say I'm looking for uh, one undergrad to work with one-on-one -on -one for the next year. So if anyone's interested in working on something like this, um, I know some of you are in Zach Ma's lab and are really good. I want to steal you. Right? So if anyone's interested in working on something like this, um, give me an email. If you're around over the summer, that'd be definitely preferred. Um, I cannot pay you. I don't have money. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but you will get a, a letter of rec. That's about all I can offer. And so don't do this unless you think this is going to be fun, right? And self-fulfilling just by doing it. With that, we will end.